Good morning, everybody. It is about almost 10 to 9 in the morning, and I have spent the last hour getting some work done and have been listening to um, yesterday's part that I needed to listen to for Where the Crawdads Sing. I will be finishing that today because I only have one more part of it left, and I was supposed to finish it today anyway. Uh, so that is going really well. I really like this book a lot. I, I've Truthfully, I feel like it's a 5 out of 5 star for me because while I don't feel like I've been, like, you know, sobbing my eyes out of the story, it's actually a really well-crafted story, and I really also feel very connected to... Kaya who is like the main who's the main character and I just I feel like this is a story of like she's a victim of circumstance and because she's a victim of circumstance she ultimately gets blamed for everything and it breaks my heart and but I love stories like that because usually what ends up happening is like the character just becomes a strong individual despite being the victim of circumstance so I just really really enjoy it I think that it's just a very well done book like I under I see why a lot of people really loved this book when it first came out and it's just it's just joy like it's very reminiscent to me also of like a Kristen Hanna book because Kristen Hanna kind of has this way of like talking about things that are happening and kind of almost making them seem otherworldly uh for instance with The Great Alone which was placed in Alaska you know that whole story of following this teenage girl as she's living in the remote area of Alaska with her father who is an alcoholic and ha suffers massive PTSD and you know having to deal with his abusive nature and like all these different things and trying to grow up in this world and you know dealing also with a community that is kind of just filled with you know people who are all of the same mindset they don't really seem to have any other kind of thought in their head other than what they've been told and taught over the course of years it's just a very fascinating kind of otherworldly experience to like see that story happen and I feel like with this one too it's very similar in that kind of scenario it's also kind of around the same time that the great alone happens uh the great alone I believe happened in like the 1970s I want to say and this story takes place in like the mostly the late 60s going into the 70s because there's like the trial going on with finding out about one of the like the murder mystery that's going on so it's winding down now like I like I said I only have one part of it left so I have just over an hour of the audiobook left anyway I'm getting ready here to take a break from work for a little bit and I'm gonna get started with Bridge of Clay. Yeah so as of this morning it looks like that Team Contemporary is in the lead. Uh, Mystery Thriller was in the lead I think by on like Friday or something like that but according to our spreadsheet Contemporary has an average of 433.75 points with Fantasy coming in at second at 390.77, Mystery Thriller still at 325 even, and Sci-Fi with 260 even. My thought is that with Bridge of Clay, I could probably get like another 100 pages read. I do want to read after work today, like sitting for like the hour and a half before Robert gets home and read, so I think I might do that. It's also just going to depend on how I feel because by the end of the day, I'm usually like really tired, and so... Um, I don't know, like, I do want to get a couple things done around the house tonight with Robert, and it's a Monday, so, you know, it's just getting to the start of the week and everything, and I'm just kind of hoping that this week's going to turn out just as good as last week did, truthfully, because I had a really good week last week, even though I had to deal with my back and my butt issue that I was having from slipping and falling on ice on my porch, which, by the way, is feeling much better. Um, right now, it's still a little uncomfortable sometimes to sit in certain positions, sit on certain parts of, like, my my butt, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's going okay. Like, right now, it's just a little tender still, a little sore, but um, I'm doing pretty okay. A cushion is usually pretty much what I need, and that then obviously getting up and moving around every now and then also really helps. It is now about 10.47, and... It's been a bit of a slow day with work. I am actually working on uploading my weekly reading vlog from last week onto YouTube. I have already loaded my Jade Empire Let's Play, so that's now live uh, for this week. And once this video is uploaded and scheduled for Wednesday, that's all of the videos I have planned for this week, other than working on this. And I don't know if I'm ever going to get to it this week, but I do have reading vlog reviews planned for the next book in the Thirst series and for Dance Macabre, but I haven't heard yet from the library about if they are ready to be picked up at all. They're supposed to be open until 5, but I won't even be able to be there until 
after that because Robert doesn't get home till closer to 5.30. So my thought is is that if they can, if they can, I would like to be able to do curbside pickup tomorrow because tomorrow they're open until 6. So, because they're only open four days a week, Monday and Wednesday from 9 to 5, and then Tuesday, Thursday from 11 to 6. So my hope is that I can get in tomorrow to be able to get it if anything comes in. I'm supposed to get a text message from the library uh, automated system when my books are ready to be picked up. So hopefully that'll come in. But I have read a little bit more of Ridge of Clay. I read like a couple chapters and I did finish Where the Crawdads Sing, which gave me 50 points for my team. Um, I didn't have it for any specific prompt. It was more so for my D&D game. And so there's that. I gave it, like I said, a five out of five stars. I loved it. The ending actually was a lot more harder hitting than I thought it was going to be because it was just something I wasn't expecting to happen basically but like it was totally fine like it made sense with the story and everything but it was just something that still kind of like came out of the blue and I was like oh, oh no kind of thing so uh really really loved it would definitely recommend to a lot of people it's a very very good literary fiction historical fiction kind of story and like I said if you like Kristen Hanna's writing I think you will definitely like Delia Owens because it's very similar I think in the overall feel and the overall kind of like you know story development I feel like that's kind of the best way I can describe it. Today I'm not going to start another audiobook I'm going to wait to do that till tomorrow. I'm finally going to finish the only good Indians because I started that in like October and then I lost the ability to finish it because I had to return the book to the library and I finally got it now and I have it for a few more days and I only have like the, the half of the second half of the book to go through so I think tomorrow I'm gonna start that back up and get it finished but it's not gonna count for the Battle of the Bookish because I technically started it a few months ago but thankfully like the first half of the book I had got through that was like its own separate entity and then like the second half of it is its, almost, is its own entity as well because it's more of like stories about certain people that are involved in this overall kind of like curse of sorts that like it's and it's their individual stories um so I got through like the first two stories of the first half and now I've got the other two stories going in for the second half so that I should hopefully get done by the end of the week. So then I'll hopefully have two books finished, maybe three if I can get this one done soon, but it's going to depend. Okay, so it's now about one o'clock in the afternoon. I haven't really had much more of a chance to read. I have read a little bit more since the last time I updated you, and I'm now on part seven of Bridge of Clay. I still am like... I'm less than 200 pages away from finishing it, but it's probably not going to get done today. But I did just get off the phone with the library that I go to because I was checking in on the fact that I have one book that I've been reserved for that they said was supposed to be in on the 5th and I hadn't heard anything. So I wanted to see like what their process was with like the, the quarantine stuff and like sanitizing everything and stuff like that so that I could have an idea of when I could possibly get the book. So... Thankfully, the nice lady basically walked me through it. She said that once they basically get the books, which since they are only open Monday through Thursday, a lot of times they check in everything on Mondays, and then they'll have other things that might get checked in over the course of the week. But if something gets checked in on a Monday, they then usually have a quarantine of up to about four days, sometimes maybe even eight, because of the fact that they only are open Monday through Thursday um, to give it the time to, you know, be quarantined and sanitized and everything, and then they will get it sent out to somebody. So basically, one of the books I had that is, um, I basically had reserved for myself, I can go pick up tomorrow. But the other one likely won't, I won't be able to get until probably next week because it, as of like Friday when they were not even open, it, they said that it wasn't in yet. So that tells me that if it gets in today, then I'm going to have to wait like, until probably next week because they're able to go out on Friday, but they're closed on Friday, so then it would have to wait until the next Monday, and then I would have to wait until Tuesday to pick it up because they're only open until 5 on Mondays, and I can't get there until after 5.30, so that's that. But that does mean that eventually I will get Dan Dance Macabre and hopefully be able to read it by the end of the month uh, for my Stephen King read and stuff like that, which also then would help with my Battle of the Bookish TBR. So there's that. And then I also basically today went through and reserved a bunch of other books that I'm going to definitely have to wait for regardless. Like they're all books that I was interested in that I saw that they recently had like uh, got, you know, involved in the library. 
like a bunch of like newer releases and stuff like that that I was interested in. Um, pretty much all of them have at least three other people waiting, so it's going to be a good while before I get those ones, but I wanted to at least put myself on a list for them so that, you know, I could at the very least have them, you know, there kind of thing. Yeah, so part seven of Bridge of Clay so far, um, it's getting, again, you know, it's okay. It's still not one of my favorites. I know last week I was very conflicted with a lot of my feelings on this, and I definitely feel like it is just gonna be, you know, a three-star overall just because I, I like the concept of the story. I like of what the family dynamic is supposed to be, but I feel like it's not executed the way I would like it to. I feel like personally it's just a lot of metaphorical writing, like I said before, that just is very confusing and it makes it a lot harder to enjoy the story in a lot of ways. But um, I do love the characters themselves. I was more so Clay than anybody else and I really appreciate the parents that were involved in the story. It's just, you know, something that like it, it's supposed to be a heart-wrenching story in some cases but I'm not getting that emotional tie to it because the metaphorical writing of it is making it hard for me to be able to have any kind of feeling with it because I'm trying so hard to understand what a lot of these phrases and stuff are especially when it comes to like you know certain things that like Matthew talks about about how Clay does things and what, all these things and like it's all you know because he's not clay it's not like a clear-cut answer as to why things are happening the way they are so it's just kind of annoying but yeah so currently like I said about 383 pages in so I have less than 200 pages to go to the end I probably will get through more of this this afternoon and then like I said after work I do plan on reading a lot of it because I've got all my other stuff figured out for today because I got my videos uploaded and the thumbnails and stuff for those made so I don't have to worry about those anymore to self when you're stuck on a book that you don't know how the fuck to explain because it's super confusing to you in a lot of ways look up the wikipedia page because that actually provides a lot of really good information so i looked up kind of the whole thing with bridge of clay because you know i was trying to find the best way to talk about it because i'm now about 40 pages away from the end if i could find something that describes the plot of the story without getting into the metaphorical aspect of it and thankfully the Wikipedia page has it. So um, essentially like a lot of stuff just what they describe with the plot makes a lot more sense now uh, because for one I thought the entirety of this book was placed in the UK. I did not know that Marcus Suzak was Australian um, and apparently this takes place in a suburb outside of Sydney which there's no indication to me in any of the book that that was the case. It seemed like it was just the UK, maybe that was just because it was so vague that it felt like that. And the only way I had any idea as to what the accent could have been was like certain phrases or words and things of that nature. But I also tend to get a lot of things confused with how, what people in England say versus what people in Australia say. Because while the accents are kind of similar, they're very different. And their colloquialisms and their phrases and stuff that they use are very different as well. So the whole story takes place in outside, just outside of Sydney, basically. And the whole thing that with the bridge that I was so confused on gets explained here, where basically the reason the bridge comes up and that Clay goes to live with his father is because when his father does show up in the very beginning of the story, which we already knew, the, the father basically asks the boys to help him with building a bridge because he's working on that. He's an architect, he does a lot of construction work, and he's working on building a bridge that could hopefully uh, withstand these like awful um, river conditions that used to go on in this town, but currently there, it's, there's a drought, like there's no water there anyway, but it would have to be something that in order for it to work, it would have to like be super, super strong. And because Clay is very much like his father, he is very interested also in the architectural arts and all that stuff. He's obsessed with Michelangelo, just like his father was, um, all these things. So he decides to go and help him. Um, and I think a lot of times, too, like, what this whole 
bridge is supposed to represent is not just an actual physical bridge that they're going to build, but it is, like I've said before, a metaphorical bridge of him, of Michael reaching out to his sons after having ran off on them after their mother died because he couldn't really handle what was happening. He lost the love of his life and having to raise five children on his own was something he didn't think he could possibly do is my guess. Um, so like it's, it kind of is like a double edged kind of thing. And Clay is the one that decides to go because I think metaphorically he is going to be also a bridge because of the fact that he decides to go out and help his father and so he wants to mend the relationship between himself and his father and then his father and his brother. There's one point in the story where he does ask his father to talk about what exactly happened because he wants to build that relationship. He wants to understand what exactly happened to his father because he does believe that even from a young age there's a point where he's like you know he must there must have been something wrong where he felt like he needed to go and he wants to know and like i said this book goes through a whole backstory of penny their mother and her going from uh poland to australia now i guess i think it's basically poland because i thought that the language was uh similar to polish because i've seen some polish phrases and stuff like that through my work so I thought I recognized it um, but basically when you know Penny gets to be 18 her father decides to send her off to Australia uh, so that she can leave and then she becomes like a second language uh, English second language teacher and you know she buys a piano which is how she meets Michael and then there's the whole backstory with Michael and how he had married his childhood sweetheart she left him he was heartbroken then he met Penny and he felt fine he was okay again and then they get married and have all the boys and all that stuff and then basically from there it's then the boys growing up how they were and how they treated them and all these things and then uh, Penny's ultimate descent into death with her cancer because it, it's very clear that she died of cancer from the very beginning. Then there is a point in the story that I don't want to spoil but there's a very emotional point in the story I was not expecting that I feel like it, it doesn't fit the story to me. I don't understand what the point was because basically there is a death. There is another death involved in the story that does affect Clay in a massive way um, but I felt like it was just not needed. I felt like there was no point to having this death because it just, it, it didn't seem to do anything. It didn't have to happen because it, it didn't really change anything about, I feel like, the story and it doesn't really, you know, change anything about what Clay is or who he is and all these things. Like, it doesn't change anything. I, I'm gonna say now, like, I'm gonna finish this book today. It's gonna happen. I know it will. My rating of it at this point is basically a three star because it's not awful. I think that there's a lot of really great things about it in terms of seeing the progression of Clay, but there's so many, like, metaphorical aspects of the story I don't get, and this whole book was based in metaphor, and I feel like it just dragged the story down a lot. I will say that I think it might have been better for me to listen to the audiobook because as I had showed last week when I had my reading vlog on this that I, there were a couple passages where I read them aloud and it felt like I understood the story better when reading them aloud so I feel like maybe the audiobook would have been the best way to go about this and I don't know if I would ever though go back to reread it. I feel like this is definitely a book where I'm you know, I'm glad I finally read it, but it's not something I'm ever going to go back to, and I think I'm going to basically unhaul this book because I'm no longer interested in it. I feel like once I get done with it, that's that. I'll hold on to it for my wrap-up, but other than that, it's not really something I think I would ever pick back up again, so... That's basically it. Um, I feel like I've said so much about this book already. Um, but, so what I will do, like I said, is finish up the last like 40 pages of this over the course of the day, um, and then rate it, and then put it on my red shelf that I have right now, and not touch it again until my monthly wrap up. And then what I think I'll do today is pick up my next one, which is Felix Ever After. That is my next uh, Battle of the Bookish TBR uh, book that I wanted to get through. That one's going to probably be a lot easier to get through because it's a contemporary and typically the young adult contemporaries I can move through very quickly. And then like I showed you, I'm working through The Only Good Indian. We are approaching the end. I have less than 10 pages left until this is done. Or, no, that's wrong. 20. <laughs> less than uh, 20 pages left until this is done. I'm getting ready to take a break from work right now. Time to finish this fucking nightmare of a book.
so yeah, that's done, finally. Good freaking god, 12 days into the year and I finally finished that first physical book. Good lord. Okay, so I've already gone through several times my thoughts on it. I'm not going to go through it again. Uh, what I will go through though real quick because I'm getting ready to finish my break here is that, like I said, my next book is going to be Felix Ever After. I also need to stand for a minute because I've been sitting down for a long time and I just need to like get up and move around and stretch and stuff. But so I have Felix Ever After by Case and Calendar. This is a young adult contemporary featuring a own voices author for trans representation as the main character basically is a trans character. And the whole point of the story is that basically at some point in his life, as he's been transitioning and all these things, he gets outed by somebody in his community that's anonymous, I guess, that he is, uh, like they use his dead name, I guess, which is like not good. Uh, for those of you who may not know what a dead name is, essentially when a person trans transitions from one sex to another the original sex that they were in whether they're male or they're female their original birth name that they were given is considered their dead name because when they go through their transition they have like a whole new identity of sorts so they change their name a lot of times sometimes they may keep it or make it kind of a more gender neutral name depending on the person but more often than not the trans individual will change their name from their birth name because it no longer fits them it no longer feels something that they identify with so unfortunately uh, Felix in the story is outed with his dead name and it causes a little bit of um, issues because of the fact that you know there's obviously a community involved that's not super accepting of it um unfortunately trans people are some of the least accepted people i believe in the lgbtq world because of the fact that they have to go through massive surgery in order to um you know change their physical outward appearance to fit who they are on the inside and unfortunately a lot of people do not understand that they believe that it's you know a crock of shit or whatever but truthfully it's not hurting anybody else so it doesn't make sense to me why you would like really dislike what a person does with their own body. Anyway, I'm, I could go on a whole rant about that, but basically this is a, uh, Felix's story and finding himself in a lot of ways, like basically trying to figure out who he really is and all these things. And I think that's basically the, the main gist of it from what I understand. That's just how I remember a lot of people talking about this book when it came out in 2020. Um, a lot of people love this. I feel like it's very rare for me to find a young adult contemporary that people really love that I don't seem to love. I, I find it very rare, especially with many of the new young adult contemporaries out there. Um, I feel like especially ones that don't focus solely on romance. I think the ones that especially like in this cons in this instance where it's more coming of age, where it's more about identity and about finding yourself as opposed to like strictly being involved in like a romantic sense. I think those young adult contemporaries, I also seem to love along with everybody else. It's the ones that like the young adult romances almost where like I have some iffiness with it because I don't think it's as believable because a lot of it's very rom-com based and sometimes it's not necessarily like my cup of tea. The exception to that though first thing I think of off the top of my head being When Dimple Met Rishi. I love that book so much. It is so stinking cute but this is like a coming of age story in a sense because Felix is like a you know senior in high school i want to say junior i can't quite remember also he is black um and he's queer so you know add those things on to his um his transgender identity that already sets him up for a lot of heartache because obviously with black representation you know we see a lot of people that are black that get mistreated a lot of times unfortunately and just people on the lgbtq spectrum in general like whether it's like he's trans and is gay um you know like that could be something that would get really attacked because of the fact that he's also black so there's a lot of like nuances and that's what I think I love the most about some of these like young adult contemporaries is that like you know they play on the nuances and especially if their own voices like Case and Calendar is you know it, it makes it even much more amazing so yeah that's basically it for right now um I have about a little more than two hours left of my work day I'm really happy that I finally finished Bridge of Clay, thank God. I'm going to input the points for that right now. Bridge of Clay was for my D&D TBR game, which was to read a big book, so that's finally done. I have now two books of my D&D TBR out of the five that are completed. And then it also, for Battle of the Bookish, counted for just the read a book challenge, uh, so I can get some points for that. Felix Ever After is just specifically for Battle of the Bookish, which was, it's for to read an LGBTQ book. Um, I think that that one, it's pretty short. 
short, so it might not take me too long to read it. I'm going to probably read it after work as well. Um, but I, like I've said before, young adult contemporaries seem to go by really fast for me because I just like eat them up like nobody's business. But the book itself is about 354 pages. So yeah, I think that I should be able to read this maybe in a night. I don't feel like really going out and doing anything. I do, though, have to go to the library. I think I said this earlier today. I have to go to the library to go pick up Verona Comics, which is one of my D&D TBR books. Again, um, it finally came in at the library as a physical copy, so I, went, I was going to go grab that. Um, if it's at all possible, hopefully I may, before I go to go do that, get Dance Macabre as well. It just depends on when it was brought in. I'm excited for the rest of this week. It's now still only Tuesday, so I have a lot of progress to make. And so far this week, I finished two books, which is amazing. That is, like, the best way to start off, like, the whole first half of this week. And then I may even finish a third one within the next couple days, which will be even better. And then I may even finish four because I'm going to probably try to finish off The Only Good Indians like before the end of the week. So if I can get through four books this week, that's going to be so awesome. And then depending on how Verona Comics goes, I may even finish five. It's going to be a good week. First chapter read and I know I am already going to love the shit out of this book. It already from the first chapter indicates there is major conflict with Felix being transgender. Um, some people, I guess, already know about it. There is this beautiful friendship I see with him and his best friend Ezra that I am so happy to see. I love seeing positive male-male friendships. Uh, that warms my little heart very much, and I already just adore Felix. I think it's so funny. And the coolest thing too is I don't see this happen very often with any young adult books, but I, I kid you not, the first like page talks about the fact that Ezra pulls out a blunt and offers it to Felix and they both take a hit and then like they, they smoke the blunt together on the way to this fashion shoot, which I... I just think that's so cool because like I feel like a lot of times like YA Contemporary is getting very much more open to talking about a bunch of different things like alcohol, drugs, sex, all of these things. But they don't do it very casually. It's usually something that just gets brought up and it's not often you see that something, especially so early in a book like this, where the drug that like a drug that they take, even though it's just weed basically, they take it and it's done just so organically like it's not a big deal that they do it it's just kind of something that happens whereas like I feel like a lot of times in the past with YA specifically it was a big deal for characters to go to a party and drink and do drugs like it's a big deal hello everybody it is now just after 10 o'clock in the evening on Tuesday I quickly wanted to update you guys real quick before I headed off to bed because I have made some major progress today I think I've read more today than I have in quite some time uh, at least like a month or so and so today I have reached chapter 9 of Felix Ever After I'm currently on page 113 and oh my god I love this book so much it's so freaking good I, I think I've kind of touched on a lot of like the fact that it's very a very nuanced kind of story in the beginning but something I forgot to mention was that I think um there's this whole other part of the story that we see with little bits and pieces of where Felix doesn't really have a mom I'm not quite sure if it was before Felix decided that he wanted to transition or afterward but at some point over time Felix's mom basically up and left uh, him and his dad and uh, started a whole new family and there's a point very early on in the story that I had forgotten to mention where basically he talks about how he has um, like hundreds of emails that he's written that he's never sent to her that like basically from when I guess he decided to transition to like current day that he's basically like written over and over and over again. The story is hitting really hard in like helping me understand a lot about the differences about people that are transgender from myself where for instance like there's a lot of like disdain they can get from family members and then sometimes even fam some family members who might try so hard to be accepting of the person that their child is like uh like Felix's dad sometimes they are still have a hard time adjusting when especially you know the, their child for so long for a large part of their life they were you know 
going by one name and they were of one gender and then all of a sudden it, to them it they kind of switched and there's a whole argument that Felix has with his dad at one point where his dad like tries to apologize for the fact that he's not able to always like be on top of understanding like Felix has a new name he has a whole new identity basically now that he's transitioned and it's, it hurts Felix because obviously, you know, having somebody that like your father dead name you, even by accident, can be really discouraging for all the progress you've made and all the things that you've gone through. And especially someone who had seemed to have been one of your biggest supporters in the whole transition, that can really hurt and be very damaging. But it also has the perspective of like, you know, coming in a little bit where it's like, you know... At, from the father's perspective, they known them as this other name for so long, for the first 12 years of their life, and it's only been about five years since Felix had gone through his transition. So it's still very new compared to how long Felix spent his life in his other name, his other gender, uh, with the father. And so it is incredibly hurtful, but I also cannot understand from the father's perspective that, um, cause I went through that myself. I went through that myself with not a child, but a friend of mine who had gone through in transitioned. It, it took me a little while to, um, first of all, even understand what was happening. Cause at the time that I knew this person, I was in early high school. They were a year ahead of me and were a good friend of mine for a long time and I had noticed that they started to like dress in you know uh, men's clothing things of that nature and then they cut their hair really short and I didn't know what that meant I just thought that they were you know changing it up that they were more of a tomboy as opposed to a girly girl kind of thing and that wasn't the case Guess we have a little visitor here and I'm gonna show you her because she's awfully cute hey, yo hey, yo you're the one what are you doing Hello? Yin? Hi! Hi, sweet girl. She likes to run around in her ball sometimes. The other one's still in the cage because she's a little bit grumpy, but this one likes to run and likes to play, don't ya? Yeah. Are you gonna go? Okay, bye! But this friend that I had, like, you know, it wasn't, this was the first person I actually had ever met that was transgender that I started to learn a lot from them about what transgender is and what it means. And I, I had met many other friends over the course of time that helped me reinforce these things, but that was my first experience with somebody that was transgender. And what I had learned from that was, like, you know, it's really important that I stay on top of the fact that, like, if this person I known in one part of their life has transitioned into another, it's important for me to adhere to what they would like to, you know, post-transition be referred to as with pronouns and with the proper name and all these things. And, you know, I, I realized, like, how important that was. And I, I always remember, like, not necessarily dead naming the person by any means, but there is this one thing that I, I'm just not necessarily certain with because the thing is, too, is, like, if you talk about somebody who has transitioned um, and you know, this person may have grown up with, you know, other people in your area, but they don't really necessarily know that that person had transitioned, you know, you know, they just didn't know the person well enough to know that they had transitioned kind of thing. How does one go about talking about that? And that's a question I'm going to, I'd like to pose to anyone out there who may be transgender. And it's a genuine question because I, as I've been going through this, it's something that I've been thinking about and wondering about that because it hasn't obviously been brought up at all in this book yet. But how does one go about talking about a person who has transitioned with somebody else that may have been in the community and have may have known who that person was in their former self or former identity, I guess, but didn't know that the person had transitioned. Like, do you refer to them, you know, at first as their dead name and then say, but they go by this name instead? Or do you refer to them as, you know, like, how, how does one go about that? Because the way I have done it is when I refer to this particular person to other people that were in my community who knew them but didn't know that they had transitioned, you know, I would say, um, obviously, they're full legal name at this point and then I would say you might remember them as this person but many years ago they had transitioned and are transgender and are now uh, male as opposed to female kind of thing like is that the proper way to go about that what I will say is like the reason I thought of that is because this book has been really 
opening my eyes to a lot about the transgender community that I had never really thought of, especially with the intersectionality that I had mentioned t earlier today. I just feel like this is such a really good book, and I'm honestly just going to say about a third of the way in already, this has got to be one of my top 10 contemporaries. But I guess I'll stop rambling and start and stop ranting to enjoy this little bean right here because, you know, she's just so stinking cute. I just, I can't help it. Look at this face. Look at that face. <gasps> Look at this little pumpkin. And she's so sweet. Oh, are you leaving again? Okay, bye! Oh, also, I forgot to mention, I did get Verona Comics today. I was able to pick it up at the library this evening, and I'm really excited. This one is my pick, my friend pick for my Dungeons & Dragons TBR game, which was a pick for my friend Adri, who was one of the hosts for Battle of the Bookish, and... Hey guys, so it is going on 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday. It has been a bit of a busy day so far, so I updated you guys last night when I was going to bed and reading one more chapter of Felix Ever After. I did read that one last chapter before falling asleep and reached page 126, and currently I'm on page 2... no, not 2, not 200 yet. I'm on page 188, so I've already read over 60 pages of this, and I'm continuing to do so over the course of the day. I am streaming tonight after work, so there's going to be, like, a lot of time where I'm not going to have a lot of time to read, and, you know, I, I'm still loving it. Like, I love it so, so, so much. Like, this is definitely something I'm going to keep, and probably will eventually be something I think I'll reread, because, like, it's just one of those really nice, warm, and buzzy books, and I think the next time I read it, I'm going to tab it and annotate it. Um, so far today, it's been pretty good. I just actually finished my audiobook that I was working on, which was The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. I gave it a four out of five stars, and I think that the, the issue with it was, for me, like, the only negative I really had about it was that I think that because I spent a lot of my time away from it, like, I spent, like, almost three months away from it after initially starting it. I forgot a lot of the stuff that had happened. I understood the main point of the story, which is basically this story of these four men who in their past had gone hunting and killed this elk, and um, it basically like started off this curse, or this, not necessarily a curse, but this haunting where unfortunately one of, like the very beginning of the story, you hear about one of the four men, um, now they're all grown adults, it, like violently murdered and things of that nature. Nobody knows who did it or what happened. Um, but you come to realize very quickly that these four men that you see each of their perspectives when they're going through this whole thing are being haunted by something. I really liked it, but like I said, I think that just because, for, mostly I think because I spent so much time away from it, there's a lot of stuff I forgot about it. Um, I also think though too in some cases that the parts I did remember I just didn't really get the whole story. Like, I understand most of it, but there were some things where I'm kind of like, I don't really remember exactly who was in the beginning, and I thought I heard names that were familiar to the beginning toward the end of the book that I thought that they were already dead or whatever. Um, so I, I just got very confused a little bit in different parts of the story, but again, that could have just been because of the fact that I spent three months away from the book instead of finishing it all in, like, once, like, at one time or, like, within the span of, like, a week. But I have to get back to doing some work today. Uh, I have about another hour, less than two hours until... I finish for the day and then I can stream for a couple hours, which I'm really excited about because I'm having a lot of fun playing The Sims 4 on my streams. I have uh, one more break that I can read uh, another chapter on, so I think by the time I hit my stream, it's going to be about, I'm going to be almost at 200 pages, which will be really nice. Um, and then after that, after I stream and after dinner, I don't know what's going to happen, whether or not I'm going to read more. It depends on what Robert wants to do because we, you know, try to make sure that like we have dinner together. And then sometimes we do things on our own. Sometimes we binge watch a show together and that is kind of all that we do. Um, and I'm not, I just, I'm not sure what we're going to do tonight. It just doesn't, uh, it depends on what exactly he's feeling. He's kind of had a bad day, though, today. Like, at work, it's been kind of rough today, so I don't know if he's going to want to do much or if he's going to want to sit and play video games all night, which I'm totally down for him doing anyway because that just makes gives me a reason to sit and read. So, yeah, that's going to be it for right now. I'll check in with you guys. If not tonight, then probably tomorrow with where I ended up. I, if I can, I would like to finish Felix Ever After because I am flying through the book, it feels like. And I could probably finish the second half of this book tonight if I really tried my damnedest because 
with getting to almost page 200, I'd only have like less than 150 pages left of the book. So I could finish it tonight if I really, really wanted to. It's just going to depend on what exactly we do. But if I have to wait till tomorrow to finish it, I'm totally fine with that too. Because I, I want to spend time with my husband and I want to... Hello everybody. It is Thursday. It's 20 after 10. I'm on a break from work and boy... Oh boy, has it been a day already. My freaking God. So last night, I ended up, you know, in total reading about 72 pages worth of Felix Ever After. I didn't read anything past what I did um, after work because when I finished streaming last night, which went really well, I really like what I'm doing right now, and I'm just very happy to be streaming on Twitch. Like, I'm really glad I decided to finally, like, do it. Um, but basically after I did that, I was exhausted. I, I really feel like I'm not used yet to the streaming for two hours and talking that entire time because although I talk a lot, I talk a lot in my Twitch streams. So um, that's kind of been the, the, the like thing I've been dealing with is like figuring out how to like use my energy. But because I was exhausted after the stream, I just had dinner and didn't pick this one back up. Um, I just didn't end up ever getting around to it. I would like to try to finish it though today because I'm on page 198 and there's like 320 some pages in this. 354. So, okay, so more like 150 pages or so, just, just over that for this left. I could probably get that done today. This is the kind of day I've had today. I've literally just sat here with my hood up all day because I, I don't know, just comfy. But I'm also very tired. It's just been very crummy today, just how I felt almost all day. But what's not crummy is I've got through a lot of my audiobook today, which is How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. I love that book a lot. It's really, really good, especially if it's like something you're going into to learn about what exactly are some of the issues when it comes to racism and kind of are, what are some of the inherent things that we as people do that we might not understand as racist. But it, it's honestly more of an exploration to on um, Ibram's life growing up and how he realized he was thinking in certain racist ways and um, kind of how he was giving doing himself a disservice in a lot of ways by thinking certain thoughts, but they, that those thoughts were kind of compounded by society at the time that he was growing up and like the, like the already inherent racism that there was in society at that time. So he uses a lot of like anecdotal stories to express certain points of racism that he came across over his life and what exactly that, that those different types of racism are over the course of the book and like what exactly it is that we need to be aware of as people reading the book when it comes to those types of racism and what we can do to kind of like try to combat that the best we can. I've also read about almost 50 pages of uh, Felix Ever After so far today. I am really excited because one of my ships I was thinking about has definitely taken off and I'm so excited because I really hope it continues or at least like it's been mentioned that one of the ships is completely possible and then like oh it's just it, it's so so awesome like I really love this book a lot it's definitely going to be already one of my favorites of the year it may even possibly be my favorite of the month depending on how the rest of the books I read this month go but um I do plan on today finishing that and then I was thinking about then almost immediately picking up Verona Comics because it's another kind of short um, contemporary. It's another like 350 page book. But I decided that probably by the time I finish that book, I'm going to want to like just kind of chill out and, um, you know, maybe listen to more of how to be an anti-racist if I can manage it. But yeah, I feel like that's kind of the good a good idea. And so tomorrow I think I'm going to start uh, Verona Comics, which will be nice. I don't think I'm going to finish it tomorrow because I am streaming after work tomorrow again, so I don't think that's going to happen. But what I probably will be able to do is because I don't have anything going on on Saturday, I probably will be able to finish it Saturday and then get through at least one more book because I think in my journal, I keep pacing because I need to stand up. My back is hurting from sitting all day. Um, 
But in my journal, Verona Comics was kind of one I was going to plop wherever because I was waiting on it to get to me anyway. So what I'm going to do then is, like I said, read Verona Comics mostly on Saturday but started tomorrow. Then the next book I have listed to read is going to be uh, book number, let's see, six, seven, book number eight in the Thirst series, I think. Yeah, book number eight in the Thirst series, which is called The Shadow of Death. This one is a bit of a chonker, but um, the book does kind of fly by pretty quickly, so I do think I could read at least the majority of it on Saturday, if not the whole thing. It just really depends on how early I get up on Saturday and, you know, what's going to go on. I don't plan on doing anything or going anywhere, so um, I probably could read at least the majority of it, if not the entire thing. And then I do want to uh, get through that one, too, because that is it's not necessarily part of my um, d and TBR, but it is, like, my... Uh, thirst reread for this month, so I want to get that started and then also get that vlog going. Okay, so I finished it. As you can tell, I've been crying a little bit. It was so freaking good. Um, I haven't had a book like this make me cry for a while, so you guys would know then that this was just really, really good. Definitely a five out of five stars. I knew I was gonna love it from like the first chapter. I just adore this book so much. I it is, takes place over the course of essentially like a month, and then there is a point where like we do jump ahead a couple months but it pretty much takes over the course of like one summer in New York City and we follow this character Felix who is a trans masculine uh individual he has gone through all his almost all his surgeries already at this point um I think I don't think he's had bottom surgery but he at the very least has had top surgery and has gone through his hormones and stuff like that and he's still taking them um and he's been like this since he was about 12 years old and you learn very early on his best friend Ezra. He's known since he was just kind of going through his transition. And they are both going to this summer program through their school to do stuff for art. And it's basically a way for them to uh, try to compete for this scholarship uh, that's a full ride to, I think, any university, but specifically Felix wants to use it for Brown University because it's basically he's trying to prove himself as, you know, capable of getting the scholarship and all these things. So the main plot of the story that everybody knows about basically is that while he's going through this program, Felix's pictures from before his transition and his dead name are posted throughout their entire school, like they're put up on the walls and displays and everything like that. Felix doesn't know who it is. Nobody seems to know. No one's coming up to say that, it, that you know, they've done it. Um, but Felix has a couple different ideas. He first thinks that it's this guy, Declan, who originally had uh, dated Ezra, his best friend, for a few months. And Declan's kind of a dickhead. Like, it's a he's a real piece of work. And he thinks that when he makes kind of a transphobic comment of sorts early on in the book that maybe Declan was the one that did it because he's the guy that really kind of seems to have it out the most for... Um, Felix because for one also they are you know they're competing for a scholarship both to go to Brown University so he thinks that you know it's his way of like trying to mess with his head and all that stuff and there's so much that's layered into the story like there's hate to love there's you know um there's a lot of you know LGBTQ people in this this also takes place during Pride Month in New York City so there's a lot of references to Pride and the March and all these things which is really awesome um it actually made me feel very like warm and fuzzy on the inside of, of about many things that, that were talked about in this the real crux of the story though is not necessarily just the plot of trying to find out who um basically like outed uh Felix it's a lot of him also then finding himself again because even though he's gone through his transition there's a lot of issues he still has with himself uh for one his mother is no longer in the picture she up and left his, uh, him and his dad when uh he was 10 and never heard from her again he has all of these emails drafted out to her that he's never sent because he's not he's too afraid to his father while he has been you know very supportive of the whole thing of him transitioning has paid for all his surgeries all his medications and his hormones and all that stuff his dad still has a hard time with accepting the fact that um that Felix is now a boy as opposed to a girl when he was originally born there's a lot of talk about you know exactly how that goes in terms of like what that means from a trans person's point of view when there's a parent that you know they seem to be so supportive but they can't even sometimes say your actual name anymore um 
There's also a lot that deals with, you know, transphobia in general when it comes to friend groups or people that don't really seem to um, know what really being trans is. Like, there is a lot of transphobia, I will say, that you will have to look into um, as a trigger warning because it, it does come up more specifically in one particular scene and, like, it's talked about, though, throughout much of the story in terms of, like, how Felix has had to traverse his life. The real crux of all of it, though, is that Felix does not really feel like he still knows who he is. He feels like there's points in the story where like he doesn't know if he fully is a guy he he definitely knows he's not female but he doesn't feel a lot of times he's just a guy like there's something more to it and a lot of this is him re-exploring that and he's also never been in love so he's also trying to find what that means what it means to be in love what it means to you know be loved be uh love somebody you know it's a very kind of multi-layered story that I think everybody who is looking at a really good real-to-life contemporary is going to enjoy because why I love this book so much is those multi-layers because Felix is not a one-faceted person. The book doesn't follow just one facet of his life and I really appreciate that. It follows all of these different points of his life that he's either trying to work on or that he is struggling with and he, we have to explore that with him. Like it's, it's really a character exploratory story because you come across these different scenarios that Felix gets himself into or that he comes across and you hear every single thought he has about it. He may have said the same thing a couple different times over the course of different scenarios, but it, it's so true to life and so true to, I think, this character that Felix literally comes alive off the page. Like, he feels like an actual real person. Um, and, and so it's, it's very hard for you to not think of him as a real person because of all of the stuff that goes into the story. Like, it packs a really big freaking punch for 350 pages. And I just, I cannot say enough what this story did for me in terms of making me laugh, making me cry, obviously, making me you know, feel things, making me angry, making me hopeful, you know, and even actually, like, questioning a lot of stuff about, you know, trans people, about, like, how they think and all these things, and feeling like I got so many really good answers. This is not, no, necessarily the one-stop shop for you to learn everything about being transgender or anything like that. There's so many other nuances that are involved with it, but as a starting off point to answer some of the most initial questions you might have about being trans, I think this is a good place to start because for a lot of people who might not really know a lot about being trans, a work of fiction, whether it's a movie, a TV show, a book, that's sometimes the easiest way for a lot of people to grasp the idea, grasp the concept of it. And actually, Case and Calendar in his author's note talks about how when he was growing up, there was this show called uh, Degrassi The Next Generation, which many people my age, maybe a little bit younger, maybe not by much, but my sister definitely would remember it. And she's like now about two and a half years younger than me, um, but definitely people who were older than me will know Degrassi. It was a Canadian TV show that would show on like Teen Neck here in the US and it was a show that basically dictated the lives of these characters in this high school at this school called Degrassi. Um, and one of the characters in the Next Generation series when I was probably like oh god probably like 13 or 14 I would want to say there was a character that was named Adam and he, he was a trans individual born female and throughout the show you see him transition into a male and kind of the issues that come along with it one of the most poignant moments for me with that was that was for one the first time I had ever heard of something as a trans person that was the first time I had also ever seen someone binding your chest, which that is a very common practice for those that are transitioning from female to male is the binding of the chest because the breasts are not necessarily something that they want. They want the flat chest that the males have. So a lot of times if they don't have the top surgery yet, they will bind their chest with like ace bandage or something along those lines. That show showcased that for the first time to me and it was like a very jarring experience because I had never seen that before. I didn't know very many people who were transgender. Later on in my life, I did know somebody who actually went through tr uh, transition and was a very good friend of mine for a long time so I learned a lot through that but I think for those of you that might have like little things like that where you may have seen something about it a long time ago but don't really fully know anything about 
what it is, this would be a good place to start because other than doing obviously your own research through resources like Google, Reddit forums, anything like that that you can get your hands on that is from the real people that have gone through those things, sometimes a work of fiction, especially one from someone who's been through that is like an own voice's story is like one of the best places you can go to learning a little bit more about the world of being a trans person. And I emphasize the fact own voices because there are so many stories and so many movies and TV shows that are written that have trans characters written into them. And nobody that writes it is themselves a trans person. So sometimes they get things wrong. Sometimes they don't, you know, go further into things that need to be discussed when it comes to a certain topic about being trans. So I would highly suggest if you're going to look into something that might be on the fiction side, look for something that is made by a person that is also of that identity. And that extends to everything from uh, a certain character that is like a black or a person of color, a book that talks about a certain kind of religion, a book that talks about a certain gender identity and a certain sexuality and a certain, you know, lifestyle. Like, don't read things that are not from the perspectives of the people that you're looking to learn more about because more often than not they will get things wrong and they will also sometimes portray those people in less than favorable ways and, and kind of even sometimes make them out to be monsters when they're really not. Good morning everybody. If you hear a lot of rumbling in the background that is the heater that is working. Um, I am on a break right now. I just finished the chapter I wanted to work on during this break for Verona Comics and I am two chapters in and already in love with this. It's so stinking cute. So basically the whole plot of the story that we learn in the synopsis is that the, it's two perspectives. We have uh, Jubilee who is a cellist and they're basically like about you know young adult age. They're looking to oops sorry my phone's going off. Um she is looking basically to get into this like summer program for music through Carnegie Hall and it's like super super important to her. She's got this audition coming up and it could literally make or break her entire life. Um, her parents also own like this indie comic shop when she's like not you know involved with cello and everything so she's like trying to help her mom and her stepmother also like run it and her stepmother is also a comic book creator and so the beginning of the story she gets involved with her friend uh, Jayla who is a black character and they get all dressed up to go to this convention called Fabcon um, and there's this prom that's going on it's like a big dance you know whatever it's like a big party uh, for this comic book convention then there's this other character named Ridley who is our main love interest basically and he is very, very anxious all the time. Like, I kid you not, I'm gonna place a trigger warning for the, his first chapter with a panic attack because, like, a trigger warning for panic attacks because he actually has one on page, like, almost immediately inside his first chapter. Um, Ridley is kind of like the black sheep of his family. His parents don't really understand him, and while he tries to, you know, do what he can, his parents own one of the biggest comic book store chains in the world, um, so he really tries to prove himself to his parents, but it proves very, very not in his favor. Like, his parents don't really understand him. There's a lot of familial drama going on, basically. But the one person in his family he still is able to, like, communicate with and really appreciate is his sister, Gray. His sister is kind of like the golden child. She's the oldest. She's probably going to be the one that's going to help, that's going to run everything when um, their parents don't, you know, when they retire or whatever it is. When Jubilee goes to the comic book convention. She meets Ridley in the elevator and he has this Batman mask on but he doesn't really have anything else dressed up with like she calls him office Batman because uh, he otherwise looks you know in like pretty you know normal attire he just has like a, a mask on and Ridley immediately is like smitten with her he thinks that she is beautiful that he like and she kind of has a panic attack because of the fact that he's like oh my god, that was a really pretty girl. Like, just the sweetest freaking thing. And then um, Gray, his sister, in, in this chapter, basically gets him to uh, try to talk to her. And she actually goes over to Jubilee and tells her, hey, I'm his sister, um, and he thinks you're really cute, but he's a little shy. Would you mind helping him out a little bit? So she gives her a balloon 
that they're selling at the uh, at their tables and stuff, like the vendors and everything. And Jubilee then goes over, grabs a Sharpie, and puts, like, a little Batman symbol on there for her bat signal so that she's easier to spot. Um, and I just think it's so freaking cute. Like, this is already going to be so fun to read because this is just absolutely adorable. But the whole plot is, like, basically that these guys, since they're from kind of warring families in a sense, it's kind of a Romeo and Juliet scenario. Like, they kind of have a relationship, but they keep it a secret. But there's a lot of conflicts because, obviously, Jubilee is still wanting to go for for this audition that is like really really important to her and that causes some strife and Ridley's anxiety makes it very very hard for him to connect and very it makes it difficult for him to open up to Jubilee when he when he really wants to like most people with anxiety are it's very hard for people with anxiety to open up and talk about what's going on and he's also still trying to prove himself to his parents and the parents on both sides are at each other's throats all the time apparently because since um you know Ridley's parents own all of these big comic book stores you know they think they're better than everybody else I guess and then Jubilee's moms they're the ones that run an indie store so they're trying to make their way but two chapters in about 20 pages in I already am in love with this I cannot wait to see how this is going to go this book is like 327 pages so I could probably probably read through most of it today if not the whole thing but I am streaming tonight so I don't want to like make that big of a deal about it but at the very least possibly what could happen is I would read probably like 60 pages or so by the end of my workday stream read more of it probably won't finish it but could finish it tomorrow like if it's one of the first things I do. The only thing that I would really need to do tomorrow is I want to work on my book because I haven't worked on it yet since the new year started and I need to get kind of going with it and start it. So I'm, excuse me, thinking that that's going to be the case. And so probably what will happen is, first thing is I would probably finish Verona Comics, work on that book, and then probably start The Shadow of Death um, in like the late afternoon, early evening, something like that, and start that vlog then. So I think that's going to be what's going to end up happening. But love this so far. I think it's so stinking cute. I'm already like getting the warm and fuzzies on in, on the inside, um, which spells very good things for how this week's gone. Because although Bridge of Clay was like one of my least favorite things to read so far this month, I pick that back up with Felix Ever After and I think Verona Comics is gonna fare well as well. I don't know if it's gonna be a five out of five stars but I definitely know it's gonna be at least a four star because I'm just already so in love with these characters and I am so excited to see their romance and especially since it's a Romeo and Juliet story which is one of my more favorite Shakespeare kind of stories. Um, I can't wait to see how they fare and obviously it's gonna have a happy ending because YA contemporaries that involve romance always have a happy ending but I want to see where the story goes because, you know, that's always the surprise in my opinion, so. Hey guys. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Um, it is going on, I think, yeah, it's just about 2 o'clock now on Saturday. I did not do a lot yesterday. I did finish the audiobook. I don't think I said this beforehand, but I did finish the audiobook for How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Loved it. Gave it five out of five stars. But unfortunately, over the course of the day yesterday, and then even for a large part of today so far, I've had like an off and on headache. This morning I had a full on migraine. Um, and so I didn't stream yesterday after work because I was just not feeling well. My head hurt so much and then uh, my stomach hurt because basically right now what's going on with um, the weather out here is that... Um, the temperatures are kind of rising up, but it, like Michigan basically can't decide whether or not it wants to warm up or stay cold because yesterday there was a lot of like sleep, but it was more so like a rain consistency as opposed to snow, but it looked like it was snow. Um, so it like melted away a lot of like the ice and snow that are like around here and it didn't freeze over, but it's it's just kind of the sudden change in pressure and temperature basically is what typically gives me migraines. I wouldn't say it's a chronic illness because it doesn't happen all the time. Actually, I get them the most often though when there are seasonal changes that are drastic. So if, like for instance, from winter to spring where the temperatures are drastically rising and then also from like summer to fall when things are getting kind of, the temperatures are lowering, lowering fairly drastically is when I will typically get the most amount of ma massive headaches or migraines, but it, I wouldn't consider it a chronic illness because it's not something that is 
debilitating me every single day unlike a lot of people who suffer from like chronic migraines. I am in Verona Comics only about 26 pages in. I didn't read much more after work yesterday because like I said I wasn't feeling well. Um, so I think that it is, I don't know if today I could finish it. I probably could if I start now but I kind of just been taking it easy because I haven't been feeling well. I did make myself some coffee. I did basically everything I know I can do to help with my migraine, and it's actually helped. I took my Excedrin. I made a cup of coffee that had, like, more caffeine than what I have because I've been trying to switch, in a sense, to, like, a half-calf almost because I drink coffee so much, and, you know, I, I but I really thought that, like, com combining that with the Excedrin might help with the caffeine to help the blood flow in my head. I also have been laying down. I had a cold rag on my head. I took my glasses off and kind of wasn't focusing on, like, a screen for very long. I have YouTube videos playing, but I wasn't really paying attention to that until the cold rag had, like, basically dissipated a lot of the um, the pain I had in my head. So I'm feeling a lot better now. Like I said, it's now going on two o'clock. Um, I, I didn't actually get out of bed or wake up until about noon today because I woke up around 10 a.m. with like my migraine and I thought maybe if I just slept a little bit longer it would help, but that didn't help at all. It actually just, you know, it stayed consistent. So I didn't get out of bed till about noon. Um, and I've just been sitting here for the last couple of hours just trying to nurse myself and like I still have a bit of a stomach ache like it's not bad but I know that my stomach hurts basically because of my migraine a lot of times when I get migraines um my stomach gets really upset and so sometimes in order for the migraine to fully go away I have to go throw up which because all that pressure in my head then kind of just dissipates uh in like afterward I don't know what it is, it's just basically because my head makes my stomach hurt so much and I then I throw up and then everything seems fine. Um, it's happened on more than one occasion. It's not something I enjoy doing by any means, but I know that if nothing else works in order for me to get rid of my migraine, that is what will help, uh, is actually like vomiting. I'm basically going to try to take it easy the rest of the day again. Uh, like I said, just, you know, do what I can, not force myself to do a lot. I, I stayed up very late last night too, so that didn't help. I was on the phone with my friend Teresa um, for a good long while last night because she is three hours behind me. She had moved out to California. Um, so, but every Friday we tried to FaceTime for a few hours to um, just catch up with the week. And she watched is my streams but I actually get to like sit and talk to her about what's going on and stuff like that with my life and check that way I also get to check in on her because she is all the way out in California now and she's all by herself and so I want to like make sure she's doing okay and her boyfriend is actually going to be going out there here in the next like week or so he's going to be actually moving himself out there so I spent about three and a half hours on the phone with her last night which was so nice but I got a little wine drunk and I don't think that helped either I think that that helped contribute a little bit to my migraine this morning um but you know it was totally worth it I had such a good time talking to her on the phone after not having felt well most of the day so and not being able to stream too kind of made me sad but she, like you know it was just really nice to be able to sit and talk to her I love I love her so much. She's one of my best friends in the entire world. And so, like, I, I always love being able to sit and just talk with her. I think I'm going to end this vlog here because I don't know how much I'm, this I'm going to read, if I'm going to finish it at all. But regardless, on Monday, I will catch you guys up with what I end up getting through. I hope you guys had a wonderful week. I hope that it went just as well as I, you can hope because, truthfully, it feels like the world is just still on fire. And so I'm trying to, like, use a little bit of escapism sometimes in these vlogs and my reading to, like, just forget about a lot of the shit that's going on in the world. Anyway, thank you all so much for joining me in this vlog. Let me know how you guys are doing if you're participating in the Battle of the Bookish. And if you're not participating in Battle of the Bookish, just tell me how things are going with your reading this month. Are you getting through some books? Have you started any or finished any books already in 2021? At this point, I've already finished five total books, four of them counting for Battle of the Bookish. So that's actually really amazing. I cannot believe I've already got through like five books. Um, and I, now I'm on number six. And then I, I probably will get through a lot more before the end of the month, which I'm very, very excited about. So I, I can't wait to see what the rest of the month has in store for me, considering that I've already gone through that much this month. If you guys did enjoy this video, even though I know it was super, super long and you stayed this long, please do give it a big thumbs up. And if you haven't already and you'd like to be, hit that button down below and subscribe to become an owlette in our flock. And I will see all of you guys in my next video. Bye, guys. Bye.